The following video is brought to you by Skillshare.com, who are offering two free months for their online courses by visiting the link in the description. Thank you, Skillshare, and let's get on with the show. I was on my way to climb Mount Fuji when I suddenly heard the train do the Neon Genesis Evangelion jingle. And this wasn't even on one of the official Evangelion bullet trains, just the heavy, clumsy, local Fuji Kyuko sightseeing line. The popularity of Evangelion is not questioned in Japan. It's as ubiquitous as Star Wars is in the West, a pervasive, unavoidable brand of pop culture because of how well it tapped into the vein of the national culture. You don't just occasionally hear the jingle on public transit. You hear it sung live in karaoke parlors, you see Evangelion figurines decorating restaurants, you see it at VR arcades. Hideaki Anno's giant robot anime is actually more about depression, obsession, and social isolation than giant robots. And the personal development of its characters resonated so strongly with Japanese audiences that it created theatrical sequels so popular that audiences had to stand up in packed theaters. The finale of the show was remade into a finale for the movie theater, appropriately breaking the fourth wall in its own title with a name like The End of Evangelion. The success of its mid-90s TV broadcast marks a definitive line in the sand where Japanese pop culture changed after. It was the first of a new wave of anime that suddenly got a lot weirder in the late 90s. Anime that broke the previous rules and criticized the established archetypes to aim for more adult audiences with more self-aware overtones and avant-garde editing with the license to start their own original properties. And that line is visible in video games, too, where a noticeably Evangelion motif colors the plots of the Xenogears games, the casting of angels as bad guys, as well as the visual language used for intro animations, menus, and Western anime-inspired characters that wouldn't appeal until long after Evangelion's prime. But what thrilled me the most when rediscovering the series was spotting its connections to Metal Gear Solid. Spotty connections, sure, through a subtle feeling of inspiration and a shared spot on the same regional pop cultural timeline, but the connection gets more solid through the career of Metal Gear's concept artist, Yoji Shinkawa, who recently designed an Evangelion Godzilla crossover figure, and it gets further solid when looking at Metal Gear Solid's sister series, Zone of the Enders, where the inspiration treads into homage territory with the same self-aware twist introducing both of these giant robot franchises. The kid piloting the robot breaks the usual fictional optimism you'd expect to insist that he's way too young for this and really doesn't want to do it. I want nothing more to do with any of you. Go kill or whatever you want. Just leave me out of it. And sure enough, there's a lot of ham-fisted references to ancient religious dogma, too. Zone of the Enders also features visibly Eva-like robots, with its 2001 release date trailing Eva's original broadcast by six years. A period that saw the blocky, square-centric mecha design of Gundam and Gunbuster give way for slimmer, sleeker, spikier, and more triangular robots for the new millennium that also evokes a comparison between MGS-1's Metal Gear Rex and MGS-2's Metal Gear Ray. But the trends of a set don't begin with MGS-2 nor end with just their giant robots. MGS-1's menus and radars heavily feature this black-on-red 90s clock radio color scheme with long, narrow Roman letters harshly contrasting against the curvy kanji of Japanese. The backgrounds behind these characters don't just look like the basement of Shadow Moses, but some of the action and dialogue of End of Evangelion's opening raid scenes remind me a lot of MGS-1's opening encounters, too. You've never shot a person, am I right? Looks like we'll be a little delayed. What are you doing? Don't think, shoot! But to get into the real nitty gritty of how much EVA is in MGS, I'm really gonna be looking at their endings. I won't get into the specific details of what happens in each story, just the techniques both authors used in each one, the similarities they share, and how they manage to appeal so much to their respective audiences. So if you're currently making your way through either, you might want to stop here. 
But like I said earlier, the official connections beyond fan interpretations like these are admittedly spotty. While Shinkawa has an official collaborative art project with the Evangelion brand under his belt, official acknowledgement of Evangelion inspiration from Kojima himself is more rare. There's uh, this picture of him wearing an Evangelion shirt on the beach, this tweet of him getting ready to watch the Netflix version, but as much as I tried, I couldn't find official interview quotes from the guy mentioning it. But again, Evangelion is so ubiquitous over there that in many ways it would almost be harder to find a Japanese developer who wasn't inspired by it in at least some little way. Both franchises work their way through complicated and convoluted conspiracies involving cloned kids, giant robots, sinister father figures, characters who reveal baskets full of daddy issues, and all of the above turn out to be more important as narrative hooks than the giant fighting robots that both franchises are named after. Both throw around some religious terminology, incorporating it into some super weird plan to accelerate mankind into a post-national or, or post-humanist utopia, with the morality of that outcome left open to both the characters and the viewer about how bad or even avoidable such a cataclysm would actually be. Speaking of religion, I oftentimes toss and turn over long sleepless nights, pondering unanswerable existential questions like, where did we all come from? Where are we all going? And what's the point of it all? If you want to find out the meaning of life, then check the link in the description and log on to Skillshare.com. Skillshare.com is a library of over 25,000 online courses covering topics such as how to portray the real you through creative personal writing, how to discover yourself with therapeutic drawing, or how to make your work time as meaningful as possible with the Productivity Masterclass by fellow YouTuber Thomas Frank. These video courses are made by professionals who aim to kickstart your personal passions into something personally meaningful at an affordable rate too. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month with two free months available at the referral link below to help give you the direction you need to sleep easier. So yeah, it's the endings to Evangelion, and, and the ending to Metal Gear Solid 2 that share too many similarities for me to look past. Both of them deconstruct their visuals to shock the audience. Evangelion turns its traditional anime animation into straight lines and doodles, and MGS2 devolves its espionage plot into fourth wall breaking shock gags before both of them melt into live action footage where the authors themselves are directly addressing the audience as crowds of real people, not fictional characters. There's a few shots of the end of Evangelion and the end of MGS2 that simply, positively do not look like they're from their own source material. I've always felt like Metal Gear gets better if you acknowledge that the game acknowledges the real world and that the commentary it has to make on its own audience usually makes a lot more sense than the comparatively crazy chronology of its fiction. It was great rediscovering that this foundational anime series did the same and in the same damn real life twist pissed off the same kind of fans for the same kind of reasons. When the movie, The End of Evangelion, goes all live action at the end, it's cutting in footage of real life death threats and vandalism that Gainax Studios faced after airing what was an admittedly weird ending to the TV show. Immediately after the show, Hideaki Anno was proud of what he managed to do with the studio's declining animation budget and how he used deconstruction to wrap it all up, but as time went on, negative reception became harder to ignore. Those death threats ramped up, his mental state worsened, and the controversy prompted him to do that ending all over again, but with a movie budget that far surpassed what he had to work with for TV. Still, though, he wasn't apologetic about it. The movie's ending is just as weird, if not more so, than it was the first time on TV. And, almost like some damn parallel timeline, Hideo Kojima made a crazy weird deconstructionist ending to MGS2 that didn't go into detail about wrapping everything up, and he also received death threats for it, prompting him to return to the franchise for sequels again and again and again. It's important to know that in the traditionally straight-laced, conservative, and hierarchical culture of corporate Japan, a studio being vandalized by hateful fans is generally considered to be crossing a big boundary. I don't think it's a coincidence that both of these franchises got as weird and controversial as they did around the same time. The late 90s, the early 80s, they're both products of the turn of the millennium. 
I think that the similarities they share are less of a direct inspirational link between the two than it is more of Anno and Kojima both working from a shared pool of cultural and historical experiences and market forces that made their work similar. They were both born in the early 60s and employed during Japan's economic boom of the 80s. And while Kojima's career sent him straight into the corporate world of his employer, Konami, Anno's career sidestepped the hierarchy entirely, beginning with making fan works with the people who would later make their fan-founded animation company, Gainax. The economic boom of 80s Japan and the unestablished norms of the two mediums these authors were working with allowed Japan's first post-war middle class to grow into adulthood by expressing themselves as individuals on a mass televised scale through mainstream pop culture in a way that didn't happen before nor after. Evangelion's weirdness was a personal message toward the audience about Anno using the series to discover his own mental illness, ending with him yearning the audience to open themselves up to the realities outside of their obsessions of anime and science fiction. MGS2's weird ending is a personal message to the audience about Kojima using the series to leave behind a work of art that he hopes to shape future generations, and how much we should move on to something else when the job is done and the words have been said. But Evangelion did it first, in 1995, fighting to make a powerful ending out of a tight schedule and a stressed budget that was working within the confines of old economic priorities. Fan service and toy sales had to be selling the series just as much as the TV ratings did, but its success paved the way for ostensibly unrelated shows, like 1998's Cowboy Bebop, which was given the green light to make a surreal, adult-oriented original TV anime in the wake of Evangelion proving that that could be done. While 1998's MGS1 may take lightweight visual cues from Evangelion, 2002's MGS2 simply cannot help but exist in the world that Evangelion helped create. Evangelion's success and influence was already established by then, and that gave MGS2 the courage to do what it did. There's a lot that isn't super easily visible on the surface, but deep down in the webs of butterfly effects that create the flowchart of history, there's more Evangelion and Metal Gear than we might ever really know. 